Welcome to XM's Performance Theater. I'm Sonny Fox, and we are honoring this, this time around an icon, a fellow who has really changed comedy as we know it, literally. Uh, he's celebrating 50 years of entertainment this year. He's gone through more changes than most people do in a lifetime, and he's invited us along on those changes. And sort of like the Beatles, we've gone through those changes with him. And he spent 50 years, think about that, 50 years making us laugh, and more importantly, in some people's opinion, he's spent 50 years making us think. Would you welcome, please, Mr. George Carlin. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming. Sure. It's your sure. first visit to XM, right? Yes, it is. Is it so okay, distance and everything? Sure. Good. You look pretty good for an old fart. Well, uh, uh, first time I've done makeup for radio. <laughs> <laughs> old fart is... Uh, oh, I forgot. You're not an old fart. You're... An old fuck. Yeah, right. I was, uh, right. I'm an old fuck. Uh, kind of like, like a fat fuck, tall fuck, the skinny fuck, short fuck, you know. Um, it's not old man. Old man is kind of like not an age or a period of your life. Old man is a point of view, you know? It's a way of looking at the world. Uh, you, there are some guys who are old men in their 20s and 30s. You've seen them. You know, they just got old mannish ways. Sometimes you see a little kid with, uh, you know, glasses and a double-breasted suit, and he's like a little old man, you know? <laughs> So it's not old man, it's not old fart, which is kind of like mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's old fuck, you know. In this respect, fuck is a synonym for the word fellow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look pretty good for an old fellow. Okay. Well, I feel pretty good for a 69-year-old guy, yep. You're going to be celebrating 70 next month? Uh, that's right, May, yeah. Wow. 70 years old. Now, 50 years in show business, when I was doing some research, I thought, how often do you speak to somebody who's worked with Ed Sullivan and Keanu Reeves? That's quite a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who's more fun, by the way? <laughs> no. uh, I, um, Keanu is really fun <laughs> on, on the set with uh, Alex Winter. I was in uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure with the two of them. And then the, uh, the sequel, uh, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Right. Um, yeah, they were a lot of fun. No, they were lot, they were very strange. But you know, uh, well, they, they they were they would never calm down until the uh, until they call for action on on a shot. They would clown and kid around and play grab ass and everything right up until the last second, and then it would be like and action, and suddenly they would be in the scene. And it threw me because I was trying to be an actor, you know, I was trying to be serious about what I had to do. Right. And uh, I'd have to just stand there and kind of like keep my mind on my first line, you know, because I'm not a trained actor. And um, well, we'll it, talk about your movie career and we're going to invite such people. Such as it is. Yes. Uh, invite people up for questions throughout Good. this whole thing. Good. But I do want to go back to what started this whole thing. Right. You were born in New York. That started it. Now, you. <laughs> Is this collar okay? Oh, this collar straight. Looks great. I kind of fussy about the collar. <laughs> Your mother uh, made a rather important decision when you were just a baby uh, to Leave raise my dad. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a, a drinker, and he was a very successful advertising salesman on uh, in newspapers, selling space, um, and he was a, an accomplished public speaker, after dinner speaker they called him. Um, and he was a drinker and a bit of a bully. He didn't, uh, he never did uh, beat her or touch her or anything like that, but he kind of terrorized her and was abusive to my brother. So she didn't want that happening to me. And um, she, when I was two months old and he was, my brother was five years old, she took us out the um, fire escape window in, our, in her, her father's apartment in New York uh, I in her arms and my brother uh, at her hand down the fire escape into the backyard, through the backyards out to Broadway and into my um, uncle's Packard and drove us off to the country and she never looked back. Then she got back into business and advertising and raised two boys during the 
last half of the recession, uh, the, uh, the Depression, the Great Depression, and the Second World War. So she did quite a job. Your mom's been quite an influence on you, hasn't she? Yeah, uh, well, she was the sole parent, of course, and uh, she was absent because she had to work. So I, I did a lot of parenting to myself. I, I, did a I, I engaged in a lot of mental activity to kind of fill the void which children will do and i had radio to listen to but um she uh, was very uh conscious of language as was her father her father a, a new york city policeman my grandpa whom i never knew i never knew any of the grandparents i never knew my father either i had the one parent in my experience um and my grandfather was a cop in New York, uh, 20 years around, you know, back way back because they were all rather old when their kids were born. So as a, as a result, this was in the 1890s. And um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, he uh, he uh, wrote out my grandfather wrote out many of the works of Shakespeare longhand during his lifetime because of the joy it gave him. That was the explanation he had. Wow. So that's an indication of the language gene at work. And my mother inherited that. The Irish have that to a great degree. Uh, some do, some do, some don't. But it, it's kind of a generalization, but it's true. It's an Irish trait, language. And uh, gift of gab. My father had it, my mother had it. So it was natural for me to uh, have that and then to she reinforced it. it these things have to be reinforced as well and she reinforced it in me now your brother Patrick was five years older than you Patrick yes uh, usually when you have a brother five years older you usually become the punching bag I know how, how did he, he was handle too busy you? out getting laid and fighting and drinking. <laughs> he don't want to bother with that so you don't have time for bullying and it's not in his nature really he you know what he told me he said when you came home from the hospital and you know about how, how a young child can react to a new baby in the house. There are kind of certain horror stories you hear about how tough it is for the kid to, right. to adjust to that, and sometimes this hostility. He said, I was so glad when you came home from the hospital. He says, I was so curious about you, and I used to watch you in the crib, you know. And he, So he, was, he has a wonderful, wonderful nature, but he inherited, I think, also my father's temper. So he was more of a fighter than I was. Uh, in the neighborhood, he he, he would um, he he was he was a physical guy, you know, in the bars and, in, and on the street corners. But I wasn't really of that of that type. You, uh, in fact, used one of Patrick's jokes last night on stage. Yeah, he's he's a great guy. He's still alive, of course, uh, up in um, Woodstock. <clears throat> he said uh, something that I wrote down a long time ago, and I just started saying it recently. He said. What we should do is take all the mentally defective people in this country and give them government jobs and just sit back and watch things improve. <laughs> <laughs> He's a pretty funny guy and, and very verbal, very, very verbal. More so than I even, I think. You and him have a sort of the same perspective on things, don't you? Pat and I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we both feel it's... Uh, you know, we're both opposed to organized religion. We're both opposed to, you know, the, the way government had, the way we, the way the citizens have organized themselves in this country, which passes for government. Um, I, I think the uh, the republic is a failure. He, he, you know, we both, for the most part, think this experiment was nice while it lasted, and we're not too impressed with the human species, because, <laughs> you know, the record is rather. Um, rather not a good one and so uh we we uh, we inhabit the same area in, in those f kind of philosophical areas and uh we we talk a lot on the phone a couple of times a week and and we have you see what we have i'm 69 years old now he's about he's 75 and we have common memories we have common experiences and nomenclature and things in our childhood that I, I can call him up and mention a brand name that is no longer in, in, uh, in existence, I, and like Ipana toothpaste. Right. I can call up and I can say, Tepat, Ipana. He'll say, yeah, wow, you know? <laughs> it's, so, it's so great. We're both, not, we're both we're all, we're Irish. There's another gen generalization. The Irish are very kind of sentimental and like that, you know? And, and, and there's a nostalgia that we love. And, um, and we're, both, we're both a bug for those artifacts of our childhood. 
and uh, and uh, it's it's just nice to have that. So common vocabulary, common background, common memories. You know. Do you remember, by the way, the spokesperson for Ipana? On television? Uh, I can be reminded, no. Lucky Beaver. Uh, I didn't know that. I did <laughs> oh, not know really? that. Really? Well, oh, television. No, no, no. Man. We're radio kids. Right. I mean, we, we experienced television when we came home from the street corner. Mm. But we didn't hang on the, uh, the television set after school the way me- the, the next generation did. We were radio kids, and then as fast as we could get out of the house, we were street corner guys. Yeah, speaking of the street corner, you hung around uh, Morningside Heights. Morningside Heights. Well, you had a different name for it. Well, they called it Morningside Heights, Columbia University because of political reasons of their own. We lived in what we called White Harlem. Uh, It it was the west side of Harlem. It was uh, technically, uh, in a manner of speaking, the white area of West Harlem. We had Cuban, Puerto Rican, a lot of Dominican, great number of Dominicans in Manhattan now, and uh, black, black Harlem, of course. So we lived in, in a kind of a a mixed area, especially uh, as, as you got out from the Irish enclave. We lived in a little, I, I would call it an Irish enclave. And as you went out from the, actually on LaSalle Street, at one time at LaSalle Street, uh, one half of that street was white and the other half of it was black. And there wasn't a lot of hostility. I mean, there were occasional things and there were attitudes probably that people held privately. I don't know. I didn't never have that in my household. I never had those, those words and those, those attitudes expressed. So I didn't have them. But I know we, I heard the kids around me. But there was never any open hostility because when you live in, in the area between two very different areas, you have to learn to get along. Mm. It, it, it's a luxury to live in the middle of one of those areas and have all these attitudes and, you know, be, be, have a chip on your shoulder. But when you live right where the two of them join, you're forced to sort of live in a third area, which is the mixture. Right. And it's very nice. It's very, uh, it, it's, a, it's a good way to start your life. Well, the people in that area, your childhood certainly impressed you. You shared them with all of us. Uh, Father Rivera. <laughs> Was he really that lenient? You could actually see the line move at confession. Yeah, yeah. Father, uh, we had all, you know we had about six priests in the parish: Father Kelly, Father Ford was the pastor, Father Russell, Father Smith, uh, and some of them came and went, and I don't remember the names: Father Daly and Father Halpern and Father Rivera, who was there primarily because there was um, starting to be more of a, a Spanish. Uh, representation. I don't use words like Latino and Hispanic. I, I say what we grew up with, the Spanish people, you know, <laughs> Spanish heritage. Somewhere in, in their mixed blood, there's, there's Sp- Spain. So I call them Spanish people. Um, and um, Father Rivera was there to serve them and to p- pastor them, uh, or I should say to tend to their pastoral needs. And, um, and, and one of them was confession. And Father Rivera didn't understand. I mean, he understood English, but he didn't he didn't sound like he understood English. <laughs> and, and we would go to Father Rivera because he was notoriously, or that's probably not the right word, he was famously more lenient. Uh, and you would get a lighter sentence, a lighter um, penance in, in confession. Sentence. And you could see uh, people would switch the line, people on Father Kelly's line, when Father Rivera would show up and, you know, they kiss the stole and put it on and go in the confessional, uh, you would see people race and rush <laughs> <laughs> over to Father Rivera's line. Father Rivera, you know, ah, I say, three Hail Mary. He, he didn't question you. Some of the priests, you know, they would question you, so how did you touch yourself? How did you touch yourself, son? <laughs> he didn't go into any of that, how I touched myself. No, you just started. <laughs> you know, he didn't want it that. <laughs> You just started doing a voice. You used to sit around the tape recorder and record these voices, didn't you? Well, I got, this was a turning point in my life, and um, it's one that people should know about. When I was a young boy, I was a mimic, and I could imitate people in the neighborhood, authority figures, teachers, shop owners, other parents, cops on the beat, and people on television. Yeah, I, I could do little imitations. They were largely imitations of other people doing imitations. That's how you learn to do Jimmy Cagney. You see another guy do it on stage, and you say, oh, okay, and you copy him. It's easier because they point out the highlights of speech. But neighborhood stuff. I, uh, I was kind of the class clown in, in, the, in school, and then after school, I was kind of like the neighborhood wise guy, one of the, one of the neighborhood wise guys uh, on the street corner. And I would gather a little audience because I would put together little routines. I had little parodies that I did 
I, I lifted things. You, everyone steals from comedians when they're starting. So I, I would steal imitations in uh, Humphrey Bogart and Jimmy Cagney and Peter Laurie, and I would do fake commercials that I had heard or read in Mad. Well, Mad Comics came along a little bit later. There was another magazine called Thousand Jokes. And I, I put together little routines, and, and they would say, Georgie, hey, Georgie, do that thing about such, and I would stand up and do it, and it would come out differently each time. And I developed this ability to, um, to stand up in front of a, a group of people and, and get their attention and get their approval. That was important to me, apparently. When I was a little kid, I'd go to my mother's office, and, I, and she'd say, imitate Mae West, do the imitations, do the imitations. And I would do the imitations for the ladies in her office, and they would laugh. And I noticed, I don't remember noticing this per se, but I must have noticed that this got me the attention of adults. Because don't forget, I was alone in that house most of the day. Mm -hmm. When I was in school, I came home and I was alone. Uh, I got the attention of these adults, and I got their approval through their laughter. They were more or less saying, good boy, George, good going, way to go. Yes, he's good, he's cute. Ain't I cute, ain't I clever? That's what this job is. So as a youngster, I wanted to be a comedian. I, uh, I was probably only eight or nine or 10 years old when I began to form an idea that I wanted to be in the movies like Danny Kaye and like Red Skelton. And, be, and I called that being an actor, but it was actually being a comedian. And pretty soon I found out the word comedian, and I wanted to be a comedian. And when I graduated from eighth grade, uh, the last thing I graduated from, by the way, um, <laughs> my mother asked me what I wanted, and one of the brothers at, at, at school, Brother Conrad, had told us that he can get a clergyman's discount on cameras. So I asked him if he could get a clergyman's discount on tape recorders. Now, this was five years after the Second World War. Tape recorders had come out as consumer items, but they were as big as a, as a small Buick. They were large. They, they were like this big, and you had to buy them in a showroom up, up above the street. They weren't on so sale in stores. I bought this big web core, long story, and I'm keeping it long, that um, <laughs> I used it. <clears throat> I used it to do voices and do little sketches and skits and uh, fake radio shows and fake newscasts and commercials. And I, I used it to more or less train myself for the thing I wanted to do. My mother was very progressive to have bought me that as a graduation present. I mean, it was, she, was a, she was a far thinker to see that in me and, and go ahead and foster that and reward that, even though she wanted me. She didn't want me to follow it, but she knew it was a healthy thing to, for me to be doing. You've always been a planner. Yeah, you yeah. had this optimistic plans, they call uh, yeah, yeah. It's this optimistic uh, attitude that if you planned it well enough and you meant well, it's going to happen. You believe yeah. that? Well, I, I would only plan things I felt, you know, that obviously <laughs> that I wanted and thought I was uh, qualified for. Uh, but this is the good example of this career planning. When I was a kid, I said, well, first I'll be first I'll be. <clears throat> Um, see, I wanted to be an actor. I called it actor because I saw them in the movies and I knew they were movie actors. So Danny Kaye and these guys, I thought, actor, okay, okay so first I'll be a stand-up comedian. And don't forget, when I was a kid, all the only place stand-up comedians worked was nightclubs, right. those kind of really more or less sophisticated places uh, where, um, where you saw in the movies, you know, and people danced and there was a singer. And, and there was a comic and... Um, and I never got into those places. I was too young and it wasn't in my world. So I knew about comedians from radio and from television uh, later, but movies when I was a youngster. So I aimed at that and I thought, well, the way to get there would be to first become, first get into radio. That would be my first move because then I could practice using my voice and I could learn to speak and do a lot of these things without an audience directly in front of me, which is the usual thing in radio. They're not sitting in the studio. And therefore, I wouldn't be as nervous or afraid. And I could kind of build up my confidence. And then I could become a, a stand-up comedian because by then there were further venues for comedians. I thought, then I can be a stand-up comedian, and then I can go, then if I'm really good at that, then they have to let me in the movies. And that was the way I looked at it. They had to let me in the movies. And that was the plan, and it became more sophisticated as I got went through 13, 14, 15 years and, and started to actually think of ways to go about it. Now, you actually 
revealed your life's plan in, what, were you 11 years old? And- yeah, when I was 11, uh, it was fifth grade, Sister Nina, and I saw her, by the way, just about three or four years ago. She came to a show really? of mine up in Wisconsin. Yeah, she was 81, sharp as, sharp as can be. Sharp, thin, quick. You know, she said, "Yeah, you lived on the top of the hill." You know, they they, they remembered me for other reasons, but but she but she actually remembered that I lived right up the block from the school. Um, fifth grade, sister nine, I used to sing at the the club meeting. They had once a week they'd have a club meeting, and there'd be new business and old business and all that kind of stuff. And then there'd be the entertainment. You could do an imitation. You could bring in your banjo, play the piano, sing a song. I would always stand up and sing a song. I sang manana in her class. Manana, manana, manana is soon enough for me. And, um, you know, some of the guys thought it was goofy and some of them liked it. But um, Sister Nina, in Sister Nina's class, we were assigned to write an autobiography. I think fifth grade is about time to look back on you. I think. <laughs> so part of the autobiography was the last page, and that page was what I'm going to be. And I said, I want to be either an actor, announcer, disc jockey, imitator, I guess I called it, or an actor. Uh, I I started with actor. Actor, comedian, imitator, announcer, or something like that. So there it was, you know, right in front of everyone. uh, And there was a nice amalgam. Uh, You can tell that the thing I wanted most was attention. That was really what that <laughs> sentence was all about, you know. Ain't I cute? Ain't I clever? Look at me. Well, you went to the army. You got that out of the Air way. Air Force, yeah. Air, right. Air Force, I'm sorry. Uh, and luckily, there was a radio station. Yeah. Uh, just off base. Yeah. It was in Shreveport, right? Shreveport, Louisiana, which sounds like a kind of a, 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 a dopey place for this. Uh, actually, it was a very hot radio market. They had nine radio stations at that time, and was very competitive. And top forty radio was just beginning. And rock and roll was just beginning because Elvis Presley's first hit came out in 19, I believe, 55 or 56. And there I was right on the cusp of all of that. And I wanted to be uh, this announcer, disc jockey guy, when I got out of the Air Force. My plan was to go in the Air Force, do four years from 17 to 21, get out at the age of 21 and use the GI Bill to go to school to learn to be an announcer and a disc jockey so that I would be learning when I was 21. Now, I got in there, and when I was 18, I was in an amateur play downtown in Shreveport in a very good uh, community theater company, by the way, Shreveport Little Theater. And I was doing a play called Golden Boy, and in it was Joe Monroe. And Joe Monroe was, um, was... famous as a radio personality in Shreveport. I was out on the base. I was in the Air Force out on the base. And I, in my off time, I would do this play. And Joe was a famous radio personality. He did the morning show. He did the afternoon drive time. And I didn't know he owned the station. But, so it was a really great station, KJO, KJOE in <laughs> that Shreveport. That wasn't a clue? <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you know, I'm, maybe I, there was a, a slight inkling in my mind, but I didn't know that he was in the outright owner. Actually, he was 51%. Now, now um, that, sh- that station was number one in a nine-station market in spite of the fact that it was a daytime-only station. They had to come on the air every morning again at sunrise, turn the transmitter on, and gain back all the listeners who had tuned out at, you know, at sundown. Uh, there are some stations of low power. This was 1,000 a, a, a watts and daytime-only, but it was number one, and it had about a 50 percent share of the market. And this is what... Uh, now, with nine stations competing with eight out of the stations, they had 50 percent of the listeners, yeah. I was going to say, this is what it sounded like if you lived in Shreveport. Alex, oh, yeah. you want to roll that? The beginning of my show. Yeah, be- Solid, how you doing? Lots of music coming up for you between now and 545. Got the brand new Everly Brothers record, and we'll be playing both sides of it for you. In addition to listening to Elvis's latest, came out this week, and we'll get things started with the new one by Chuck Berry. Stick around, good things happening here on 1480 at Carlin's Corner. Yeah. You didn't even talk up the whole bed. 
No, I didn't use it. I, I, I liked when the when the brass came back in. I used to oh, let the brass, the brass come back yeah. in to build. Uh, those Carlin's are great jingles. Corner. Listen to that band, huh? Pretty good band. Yeah, well, if you went to the next market, it's the same band with a different set of... That's with, right. With, yeah, the jingles were done in Dallas. It was a big jingle mill. So there you were on the radio. Now, was that the first time that you really got that feeling that of not power, really, but... Hey, I, I'm reaching people that don't know me. Or I don't know. Yeah. Them. Well, surely. Yeah. I mean, just by definition, of course. But the way the way the mechanics of the thing happened, I was in this play, and Joe Monroe was in it. So I said to Joe, I said, Hey, Joe, um, I wonder if I could come down and watch you do your radio show because I'm going to be a disc jockey when I get out of the Air Force. And, I, and that was my first step uh, being in the race. So I didn't bother telling him about comedian and all that. I'm going to be a disc jockey. And, and I'd like to watch your show and pick up some tips and see how you do it. He said, yeah. He says, come on down. I still didn't know he was the owner. I got there and watched his show and he went off the air at sundown. Let's say it was 6.15 that, that night. It changes. It gets later and later as the summer goes on. And, and, he, and when, the, when the show was over and the station was off the air, he said, uh, go on in the control room there. I'll stay here at the, the board. Go in the control room there and uh, the announcer's booth room and, and read these. Read some of this news copy and read a couple of these local commercials. So I brought them in there and I read them in my best, you know, assumed announcer voice. <laughs> I was 18. I, I still had my New York, I guess. Well, I had a non-regional accent that I had been kind of... Um, um, cultivating since I had the tape recorder, but it wasn't perfect. I still had some New York vowels that gave me away. But I read for him, and he liked it well enough that he gave me a job on the spot, starting me at it was 60 cents an hour, which he knew, well, he knew cheap labor when he saw it. <laughs> 60 cents, but I forgot, I was in the Air Force. I was eating free and sleeping free and getting a little money too. So it was fine with me. I would have worked free, obviously. Uh, the job was weekends only, Saturday and Sunday, and five-minute newscast. We had five minutes of news every hour, you know, five, 55 music, five minutes of news. Reading the newscast, the ones that were not sponsored, the sustaining newscast. Oh, they were either, it was either for the U.S. bonds or join the Navy or some kind of, you know, drive carefully, those kind of things. So I learned the weekends reading those newscasts, how to read on the air and everything. And pretty soon I got a noontime spot where they played nicer music. It wasn't top 40. They played kind of like nice music. Joe was a musician, actually. So that's how it all began for me. And, and I saved all that time. I was, I, when I got out of the Air Force, and I got kicked out a, a year early. I was going to say, we did, we, you keep saying when I got out of the Air Force, but the fact is, you were kicked out of three high schools. That's right. Kicked out of uh, choir, choir, kicked out of uh, summer camp. Altar boys, summer camp, altar boys, and Boy Scouts. And uh, <laughs> that's called... <laughs> Yeah, that's, and the that's, Air Force. That's called the hat trick. <laughs> now, what, what was the terminology of the Air Force the, used? The Air Force discharge? That was, uh, it was a general discharge under honorable conditions. It wasn't a BCD, a bad conduct, and it wasn't a dishonorable. So I got all my pay and allowances. But they let me out early because they were looking to cut manpower. And they looked in the areas of people who were being less productive than others. And I, I, had, st I had stopped. I was in a very elite maintenance squadron. We, we had to have the highest IQs going into the Air Force of anyone uh, to get into uh, K-systems. We, we ran and, and maintained the bomb navigation system. They were analog computers and radar systems and, and, uh, and, and optics. Uh, we, we repaired them, and that was a very advanced system made by a lot of different, it was in the Boeing 747, which was the, the medium bomber. And uh, I got out of the maintenance area. Once I got the job in the Air Force, they thought, well, that's pretty good. We got a guy they were doing kind of public relations for the base. You know, mm -hmm. this is good for the Air Force base to have a guy who's being productive and not just knocking up local girls, you know. So, <laughs> so I got out of my career field, as they call it. And because I had, I was not productive in, in their minds. And so I could get out 11 months early. And I got out at 20. And at 20, I had my GI Bill of Rights, and I had three years experience in the field I wanted, and I had beat the game. <laughs> Very good. Yes. Yeah. It was a good start. It was a great start. It let me know that, man, you can make some breaks for yourself. 
And the next stop was KXOL, and you met uh, in uh, Fort Worth. Right? I met Jack Burns in Jack Boston Burns. on radio up there, but I wasn't suited for that station. It was a network station with soap operas and, and stuff, and I went up there because you always want to get to a bigger market. When you're in radio, the first thing you do is you start recording your voice. You start taping to make your tape. <laughs> you start making your audition tape so you can get to a bigger market. There's more money, more exposures. You can move on. It's a farm system, you know? So I wanted to get to Boston. I thought, well, I'll go to that station. I had a friend who got me in there. The guy was in the sales department. And I, and I figured, well, I can make a base there and I can look around Boston for a top 40 station to go to. But it never worked out. I, and then, so, But I met Jack Burns there. We roomed together with a third guy, Ron, and um, hit it off very well comedically. And I, I got, to, uh, I, I lost that job. I, I got kicked out of there for we taking the news unit, the mobile news unit oh. from Boston to New York on the weekend just to buy some grass. Right. That was what I did. <laughs> so, you know, once the twig is bent, you know, uh, so grows the tree. And there I was. <laughs> But, well, but, wait a minute. You didn't go there because the pot was so good in New York. You didn't know anybody in Boston, right? I didn't know anybody in Boston, and I wanted to be with my buddies down in New York. Right. So we had we were five of us driving all through Harlem looking for grass because we knew where to go. Hunt 35th Street was the stop. We had certain stops we could make to buy grass. And, and we're driving around in this thing. with It says on the outside, it says, W-E-Z-E, NBC News, you know. And we're, we're looking for grass, and we're all, we're all like guys, you know, in our early 20s. So it was a lot of fun. But... Uh, got fired from there, went, uh, was out of a job for a while, and then I got called down to uh, Fort Worth, where another guy from um, radio in, in Shreveport had moved on, a, a sales director, and he wanted me for their station in Fort Worth, so he brought me down there. So number one station, I got the homework shift, 7 to midnight, took all, answered my own phones, took all my own requests and de uh, dedications, and suddenly one day Jack Burns showed up from Boston. He says, he says, I'm going out to give Hollywood one last chance at me. That was his attitude, which is the way to look at things. And he, his tires were bald, so he, luckily a news job had opened that day, and he got that job, and he was my nighttime newsman. And you know the rest. We went down to an after-hours comedy joint, which was really a coffee house <laughs> called The Cellar in Fort Worth. And we did impromptu sketches every night, impromptu skits and two-man stuff. And it was so successful, we left radio. We said, screw this. You know, we had great jobs. We were making like 300, 400 a week. It's 1960, and we're in Fort Worth, a good market. And we could have gone on from there, but we decided to quit radio because we'll go to Hollywood and become stars. Because we have this filthy act that we did. Filthy. <laughs> it was just, and, and in those days, filthy comedy was not, didn't have a market for it at all. And there we were, how naive, but how wonderful when you're in that age period, to just get in my newly bought Dodge Dart Pioneer <laughs> with the tinted windows and the AM FM radio and drive to Los Angeles on spec, you know? On speculation, we had about $300, and um, we got lucky out there. We got lucky, I got lucky every time I turned around. Well, when you went out there, you got a job at a club. Yeah, we, we, well, well, no, what happened was this. First, we went out there and we were looking to see how we could get into show business. We knew we had this act we had written, and in the daytime we'd write stuff and learn it. It's terrible. So, um, we would go to places and look at other people, and we'd hang around Dino's on the strip and figure Frank Sinatra might come in. We hung around the Brown Derby <laughs> one night, and uh, Rock Hudson came floating through. And, <laughs> it, it, you know, we, just, we were just using up our money. And one day we went back to the apartment, and the rest of our money had been stolen out of the sock drawer. Good hiding place, George. And uh, we had no money. So we thought, well, gee, we hadn't counted on that. Um, and we had vowed not to work, just to go straight into show business. We didn't want jobs, none of that bellhop stuff, none of that car hop, none of that stuff. We, were, we won't go into radio out there. But what happened was the only thing we knew was radio. And the only thing we really w felt we should, we deserved was radio. The biggest, the second biggest market in the country. I mean, it was sheer lunacy to expect to just get into that market. But we went around, we went around, we went first to KFWB, number one in the market, top 40 station. And uh, they, uh, we didn't have tapes or anything. They didn't want us, you know. So we're walking along and we see this radio station, KDAY. 
uh, right near Hollywood and Vine. It's actually it's Selma and Vine, in between Sunset and Vine and Hollywood and Vine. We walked in there, and that's where my star on, on the walk is now, out in Hollywood. Really? I, I had them put it out in front of that radio station. It's kind of <laughs> nice. Um, we went in there, and they were looking for a morning comedy team. I mean, it's just all luck, you know? You just get lucky, and you're on a roll. They were looking for guys like us. We did a tape for them. They loved us. They called us the Wright Brothers instead of by our real names. They called us the Wright Brothers. But it did a big publicity campaign, ads in variety, full-color ads and everything, and put us on the air. And here we are on the, on the air about but, um, let's see, it would only have been about two months after we got there. And it was just sheer madness, you and, know, there we were. That wasn't good enough for you? No, no. <laughs> what, we did, what we did was still work on the act. We're going to work on the act because this is only a stepping stone, you know. And now we're making about 500 a week and each, each, you know, and that's good and we're great. And, but we're, we're practicing this act after hours. This was also a daytime station, by the way. Even though it was a 50,000 water and it had a big signal out on the West Coast, it was a daytimer. And we went off the air at sundown and in the studio, we would work on these routines. We were getting serious now. And nearby, about two blocks away, was a coffee house. That was the way for us to get in. They were now coffee houses. It was the era of the beatniks. And coffee houses liked offbeat entertainment. And we knew we could get in there and, and do our stuff for the owner, maybe, and get, get a shot. Just get a hootenanny shot. Get a single shot, you know? And we went over there. He liked us, and he hired us for two weeks. And... We're still rehearsing our act, and a guy came walking through the studio because it was an office building, and you could see the studios on your left, and there were little offices here. He was a song plugger. He was a guy who used to do PR for songwriters and stuff and record labels. And he saw us, and he used to be the road manager for Rowan and Martin. And he says, I think you guys could make it, you know? So we gave him our, we became, ma he became our manager. We went in this, this little coffee house. They, they held us over for six weeks. Lenny Bruce came in and saw us. Mort Saul came in and saw us. And based on that, more, Lenny Bruce, we got a contract with GAC, one of the biggest agencies in the country. They had New York offices, Chicago, and, and Beverly Hills offices. And we got into nightclubs where we quit radio again. We quit. <laughs> we said, no, sorry about that. We've got something to do. And we went on and began a career that worked out very well. Two years together, we were on The Tonight Show with Jack Parr that October. We drove out of Shreveport in March. We drove out of Shreveport in March, and that October, we were on NBC television at night on the biggest Whoa. show for a comedian. It's just stupid, you know. <laughs> but, man, it can happen. It can happen, you know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I've heard the term luck of the Irish. Maybe yeah. it started with you. I know it. But it's just, um, I, well, I think the luck comes from heredity. You know, that's the first draw you get of luck, good luck or bad luck. Jack Burns, by the way, uh, if you're not old enough to remember, went on to do Burns and Shriver, who you may have seen on Ed Sullivan's show, doing their taxi cab taxi routine. Taxi cab. Jack uh, was the bullet uh, in the back, That's the bigot a... in the back, and he, he, or Avery was the cab, cab, cab. Yeah, well, you know, these commies out there, the commies, you know. <laughs> he, he did that character very beautifully, and he had a good career. And he played, he played Warren in the, when Don Knotts retired from Mayberry RFD, he played Warren. He was the new deputy. And he's had a good career writing and producing things. Now, you went on to become a solo act. Yeah. Uh, we each of us wanted to, to eventually become soloists. Ed Sullivan. Yeah. How in the world did that happen? Well, that's a, a part of the, the process as you become known. This, this was the era of um, variety television. And there were two important syndicated TV shows at that time, Merv Griffin and uh, had, a, had a show, um, it was 90-minute nighttime show, and it was syndicated as, as opposed to being on a network. And so was Mike Douglas. Mike Douglas had a daytime show that was syndicated, both out of Westinghouse Radio, uh, Westinghouse Television. And I did about 15 Merv Griffins, and I did about 15 Mike Douglases. By the time the networks noticed me, the net producers for the network, the guy who produced the James, Jimmy Dean show, uh, they got me on there, and they, they, I did a monologue on there, and then they kept me over, and I did another monologue the next week, and there I was on ABC television. And from there, I, that, those same producers did a summertime show the next year. It took Andy Williams' place on the Kraft Summer Music Hall, uh, it was the Andy. Andy was on in year round, not year round, but everything except the summer. 
the TV right. season. Right. And we took his place during the summer, calling it the Summer Music Hall, with John Davidson. And I was the house comedian and the writer. And from there, that's when Ed Sullivan notices you, or the Carson people notice you, or Hollywood Palace, or whatever other variety show you were going to get on. That was a, there were a lot of variety shows then. Carol Burnett, you know, right. uh, Jimmy Rogers, a lot of them. Do you remember meeting Ed Sullivan the first oh, time? Oh yeah, sure. Tell I mean, it wasn't. Say, he's kind of he was you know, he was just what he looked like. He was you know, <laughs> <laughs> but he uh, he took a. a I held out. They wanted me on that show. Here I am, you know, still now in my early developmental stage, although I was on national television a lot. And they wanted me on The Ed Sullivan Show, and I resisted because I had heard that they were very brutal with comedians about cutting their time at the last minute. You have six minutes, they come and tell you to cut a minute because the monkeys went long, you know. <laughs> Sorry, but the baboon went long. You're going to have to cut. So I didn't want that because I did, I did set pieces. I didn't do a series of jokes that I could cut five of them out right. to take out a minute. I did a piece that, required, that I had memorized that was six minutes long, and that was it. And you couldn't take out anything. So I didn't want them going around doing that to me. Uh, that would usually happen, you know, you have dress rehearsal in the afternoon, and then you would have the broadcast at night, live, 8 o'clock. And it would happen between dress and air, they would tell you to maybe cut a minute. And then between air, when they started at 8, and the time you went on, 8.40 or something maybe, they would come and tell you to take out 30 seconds more or something. So it was, I didn't want that. I was, and I was fearful enough doing live television. So um, I finally gave in, and I wound up doing 11 Ed Sullivan shows. Uh, and I, I wound up really writing some very poor material. Uh, I mean, my, my standard really fell off because there you are, you're offered two more Sullivan shots and the money is great and, and you know the exposure is important and you want to, you know, do that. So, you know, you go ahead and you write a piece and it's not quite what it all. Well, yeah, but I was surprised going back listing, you did the hair poem the one time, the one that was Sullivan shot. toward the end of the show. Yeah, yeah. The, the hair poem and the thing about uh, the uh, ecology. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was surprised. Did they give you any flack about that? I mean, did you have to no, review that? No, no, it was by then, um, uh, that, by then I had my beard and I had begun to grow my hair and I, uh, I had stopped wearing a jacket. It was more of a vest look. You know, it wasn't uh, kind of like... Um, uh, street clothes, they were a little nicer, but they were nonetheless a shirt and a vest, you know. And um, at that point, uh, they had, you know, he always accommodated, they always accommodated the change. Uh, Elvis Presley was on there, and the Beatles, and, and the Stones, and, and they always, you know, they still did an opera singer, they still did people juggling plates. Topo Gijo. But what, what I did was, uh, you know, I they told me I had a choice between two jokes. Uh, at dress rehearsal, I did, among other jokes, I did two jokes that were topical. And, they, and, uh, and one of them was about Governor George Wallace of Alabama, who was running for president, who was a racist and a, and a segregationist. And, um, and he had a favorite saying he would always talk about the liberals by, by referring to the pointy-headed intellectuals. He called them pointy-headed intellectuals up there in Washington. You know the point, he was a populist, he, he appealed to a populist kind of a racist thing. So, um, so um, he, he called them, and, and I said in this routine, I said, uh, talking about George Wallace, I said, you talk about pointy heads, have you ever seen the sheets those people put over their head? <laughs> so that was one joke, that was one joke in the monologue. Another joke in the monologue was, about Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali was the champ at that time. His name was still Cassius Clay. And he was the champion of the world. And they took away his championship because he wouldn't go to Vietnam. He refused to go. And he was, of course, right to do that, um, I think. Uh, now, what I said about it was this. They, they, they told him, you know, no more, sorry, you can't, no more, bo no more boxing, you know, because you won't go and do your thing in, the, in Vietnam. So I said it this way. I said, Muhammad Ali... His job was beating people up. That was his job, beating people up. They wanted him to go overseas and kill people. And he said, no, I don't want to kill people. I'd rather just beat them up. <laughs> and they said, all right, well, if you won't go and kill people, we're not going to let you beat them up. <laughs> Which was, and they, they told me during, between, between dress and air, they told me, they said, you can have your, this is the oddest censorship I ever experienced. They said, you can have one or two of, one of those jokes or the other, but not both. 
it, it was volume rather than <laughs> it was the strangest thing. So I t obviously I chose the Muhammad Ali joke, which is far smarter joke, you know, right. than the point he had. And uh, so that that's, that was my memory of the last the last show I did. Uh, you know, he went off the air. Actually, I did the second to last Ed Sullivan broadcast, although we didn't know it at the time. We found out later that you know when mm -hmm. he was canceled. Uh, now here we are into the '60s. I I'm taking longer than I had planned because you're that's okay. there's Remy's so many already. things. Uh, you're into the '60s. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've been getting high since you were, what, 14? Yeah, 13. And you were going through... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> these, these things are important. These that year does make a big difference. That's right. Uh, but but uh, here you are, you're 30 years old. The uh, summer of love is going on, mm -hmm. uh, 67, mm -hmm. 66. Everyone who's involved with that is generally about 20 years old. And their parents are 40 years old. In, in the nightclubs I was working. And you're in the middle. Yeah. And you're playing to the parents, yeah. and you made a decision at that point that you were playing to the wrong audience, basically. Yeah. Uh, just a, a small um, backstory to that. Uh, remember the Danny Kay dream as a child? I wanted to be like Danny Kay. So that was what I was pursuing in show business, and that's where I had come to that point. On the, on the road to, I found out in the interim on the way that I wasn't such a great actor, and I wasn't going to be in the movies, but I found out I was a pretty good writer of comedy, and that I could probably do that and figure that out for you know, the rest of my days and let that be my thing with some movies thrown in. you know. So I got to that period, and I, and I had dropped some mescaline and some acid, as had a lot of my friends, and I hung around with mostly malcontents like myself all my life I had been you know I get remember I got kicked out of all those things because I was I, I, I defied authority all the time I wasn't in step I was constantly out of step with this society and and the authorities in it and that was my B life my a life was I'm gonna be like Danny Kay which if you think about it is a mainstream path that's something that you do that's a people pleaser thing you have to learn to please people and go on and get bigger and bigger audiences and become a famous movie star and that's how you do it. But I had a bee life that I didn't know about, that I didn't realize w w that, that this was bifurcated. I had a bee life which was, fuck all these people, you know? <laughs> fuck all these people. I don't buy this shit. Now, that person was being kind of like suppressed uh, without my knowing it. Uh, I mean, I lived it out in my private life. I hung out with musicians, and their, their hair started to get long, and the music started to change in the 60s, and the music was protest, and I was hearing people who were using their artistic talent to further their ideas and their philosophies. Oh, Buffalo Springfield and, and, and the Beatles and, and Bob Dylan and, and Joan Baez and so forth. And I'm thinking, you know, that's starting to dawn on me that I'm, I'm not using my ability to further these thoughts and ideas that I agree with. I have thoughts on that too, and I'm not doing that. I'm entertaining these businessmen and shit in these nightclubs doing people pleaser shit. So I, I, something struck at that time, and it was probably the acid, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I realized that I was in the middle, that these people were in their 40s, I was entertaining the kids in their 20s, well, kids, not the people in their 20s, were embracing the anti authority that I had. Uh, had lived. So I said, well, I, this is where my audience should be. And I, I, I redid, I didn't redo, I wrote a new act. I, I, I put in a lot of my thoughts and feelings, and, and it became autobiographical. That was the first thing that a writer does usually, is to write about himself, even if it's thinly disguised. Mine was open. I talked about being a Catholic, being a school kid, uh, being a New Yorker, and uh, the things that had affected me and that I enjoyed about school and, and those experiences. Yeah, but during this awakening of yours yeah uh you fell victim like a lot of us did to when you're doing drugs and whatnot you it's not always conducive to productivity and yeah, sure. uh <laughs> well if yeah once you get to something that you can't put down right you know i could the, the beer and the pot or my lifelong buzz was beer and pot uh, you can put that down. You can regulate that. You can say, okay, well, today I have to do this. So, you know, right. start, I'll just have about two beers in the morning <laughs> and, and smoke a half a joint, and then I'll do that, and then I'll get high. Uh, so <laughs> that's... Uh, but, but when you get to things like cocaine or any of the other ones we all know, and you get to the addictive drugs, uh, it's a different story, and that's what happened in the early 70s once I had started my record career. Uh, one, of those, one of the fallout... Uh 
th the things that happened as a result uh, was uh, Carson. He sort of distanced himself yeah. from you when you're going through this change. Well, when I went through these changes, my appearance, said, you know, my hair got longer, my beard grew, and my clothing became closer to the, I guess you'd call it the hippie ideal, you know. And now some people in show business, some old, you know, the old timer, not old timers, but the old school people, you know, they thought that I was making a very crass decision to, as, as I heard it from one guy, to cash in on the hippie thing. That was their way of looking at this from the outside. They weren't attuned to the kind of, you, you know, pot is a, is a, is a value-changing drug. It's a hallucinogen. It's a mild hallucinogen like acid, and it's a value-changer. And if you smoke from the time you're 13 to the time you're 30, you have fo formed certain attitudes, and this, it, it just uh, reinforced my, my um, malcontent, my outsidership, the feeling of being outside and not belonging. So... Um, these uh, these people had never had that, so they couldn't see that there might be some integrity in what was happening right. to me. And they thought, well, he's just trying to cash in. Don't worry about it. They'll see you through him, and he'll. He thought you were doing a Bobby Darren. With yeah, this right. right. Just going to the mountain and coming back. I am different. <laughs> and it, it, it wasn't that. It took two years for this change to take place physically, with the growth of the beard and the hair. And I did it on television. There were syndicated shows I was doing by that time. Virginia Graham had a five day a week show. Della Reese had a five day and so did Steve Allen and on these shows in this change period I would explain what what it was that I don't belong in nightclubs I belong on the colleges I belong on the campuses uh, the beard would get longer the hair would get longer and um, by the time two years was up I was there but in the meantime regular show business which I cared very you know little about but, she, but Johnny Carson was important that was another platform that I wanted to show my kind of like new self. And they got afraid when they heard about it because they thought, oh, he's on the acid, he's on the acid, you know. <laughs> and, they, and they don't know, they don't know what you're gonna do. And I, I, and I came in to see Johnny one time and what happened was my wife had redone, she had written a um, press kit uh, that was very f kind of telling about my new change, my new direction, what I wanted to do. And I was going to handle myself and just kind of be my own manager. And, I, and the press kit, I wrote a very funny thing about why I was wanted to go to the colleges. I want to go to the colleges because you can steal lab equipment and stuff. And it was a, just a very bizarre letter. And I signed it with my left hand like a two-year-old, you know. And so they, they saw this at Carson and they thought, this guy's fucking nuts, you know. <laughs> And they dropped me. I had already done probably 10 or 15 Johnny Carsons, maybe more than that. And they dropped me. And I, I was a year before they could see this other new self take hold, get some credibility by virtue of the fact that I was working in coffee houses and filling them. And then I did concerts and I filled them. And then they said, oh, OK. And they let me back on. Yeah, but you made the mistake. Well, I shouldn't say it was a mistake. That's for you to decide. But you got all coked up and uh, yeah, oh, ran yeah. into Johnny's dressing room. I went to no. I went. To, I asked to see. I asked to see Johnny in his office. Oh. I asked to come over because I wanted to present my case. I wanted, but I was full of coke and I was real speedy. You know, I was Greg getting my seat and uh, and probably my legs were going like this. You know, and everything. I don't know. And, and I had a tie dye shirt that was really garish and bizarre looking. You know. And he, that just confirmed what they thought. They thought, oh, my fucking Christ, look at this, you know. <laughs> so uh, I had to fight my way out of that by, by being accepted in the place I said I would be, which was, you know, younger. A, a more, I'll call it a more youth-oriented culture, you know. Well, Johnny obviously know, knows talent because you ended up coming back yeah. and hosting. You you filled in as host guest host how many times? I don't know. It must have been 20 times I guest host. I've done 140 of those shows, counting Jay Leno, starting with Jack Parr. Did you enjoy co-hosting? Was that too straight for uh, you? I, I, no, it was, uh, I enjoyed the, f the uh, status that it gave me and um, the exposure to talk about whatever other things I wanted to talk about. But it wasn't coming. And I was loaded on coke on a lot of those shows that I co-host. <laughs> I did one show when I was loaded, and David Carradine was, my, was one of the guests. <laughs> all right? I, I believe he was on acid that night. <laughs> I, I only just say I believe that. I've never asked him. He came out in this one of these, you know, he was in that kind of, uh, 
uh, Far Eastern that period. Kung Fu thing. Yeah, yeah. well, it was, it was more like Far Eastern. It was it was kind of a diaphanous sort of a flowing white garment, you know. And he came out and he was sitting there on the couch with his legs in the crossed position up on the couch. And I could swear to this day that each time I asked him a question, that he was answering the next one. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's how fucked up I was. <laughs> and you do have a list of the questions, so you kind of know what's next, because you do rehearse what you're going to ask. But uh, I don't know how that would be possible, but it seemed like he was doing that. I'll, I must try it. I wonder if there's anyone out in in uh, eBay land who has an old Video copy of that for it? some odd reason. Yeah, I have a lot say, of old Can stuff you imagine it. Mr. and Mrs. America laying in bed watching Yeah. Them, and you guys are on. I know. I know. But different, by the way, speaking of being coked up, uh, the very first Saturday Night Live, yeah. you were the host. Coked all week. And is yeah. it, did they have to bang on your door and get you to come they to They say they or? did. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's been said to me. I believe, I believe it because you do get, you know, you do lock all the good bolts and things and shit when you're getting real paranoid, you know. Uh, yeah, I did. I did, had great coke too, and I did it all week. And um, and I didn't like what I did on the show, and I was afraid to do sketches. Uh, I didn't want it. I told Lauren the first day. I said, "Don't put me in sketches. I'm not good at that." I, I really didn't feel very confident about acting ability, and I, I didn't know sketch acting is different from uh, acting, acting, so I didn't make that um, that accommodation in my mind, so I just said, leave me out of everything, you know, just let me do little spots, let me do little monologues, 30 seconds, a minute and a half, two minutes here, and all through the show, and that's what they did for me, they left me out of the, uh, the sketches, but I can see myself, I can see me, myself grinding my teeth on that um, first broadcast, if you ever see the DVD, watch for the guy grinding his teeth and <laughs> catching catching his breath, you know, kind of like, you know, like, uh, you know. You tell, I believe, you tell me you had a, a collection of, uh, a, a videotape collection of you over the years showing your hair different lengths and whatnot. I did. I must have lied. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what I might have been referring to the fact that it, you can do that if, if a oh, person okay, wanted right, to, they could right. do that. <laughs> The Great Recession. <laughs> well, during this time uh, in the 70s, when all this, you were finding yourself and going through these uh, yeah. uh, changes, you did a couple of movies. Uh, you did Car Wash, the Richard Pryor. Yeah. Uh, and you and Richard had worked together, though, before. Well, uh, the way I, Jack and I, Jack Burns and I broke up two years after we formed the act because he wanted to go to Second City, and I, for, I wanted to be a single. I had gotten married in the meantime, and uh, I wanted to be a, a single uh, and, and have a, and for Brendan and I to have a baby. And I, I had to get out on my own. And he, we were in Chicago at the time, and that was the birthplace of Second City, and he was very qualified for, for improvisational theater, very much more qualified for that. Uh, so uh, we split up. We worked that night. We worked two weeks um, at the living room with Vic Damone. We made uh, $750 uh, uh, for the team a week, and that was a really good level for us. Great to be working with an act like Vic Damone. He was, as if some of you may know or not know, uh, a, a, a great singer who Frank Sinatra said had the finest pipes of any male singer. And he had a string of hit records and mm. a lot of things that were really fine work. And um, Vic, uh, we, Jack and I broke up the night we closed at the living, living room. We broke up peacefully. And um, <clears throat> the next night I opened down the street from the living room in the nightclub district at a coffee house called the Gate of Horn. I opened up with Miriam McCabe and Peter, Paul, and Mary, and I was the third act. I was the opening act. And uh, from there, I went on, Jack went on Second City, met, uh, or, you know, met um, Avery there, and that one became a, a story. Uh, and uh, what was it? Well, oh, the Richard what I was Pryor. Asking. Oh, Richard Pryor. Well, that was a period that began then of, of two years of, of drift. Uh, I did not have a partner. I, I worked out some of the uh, contracts that Burns and I still had pending, mm -hmm. uh, places like the Playboy Clubs. I worked them alone, but then I never got renewed, and I didn't have much work. And so I decided in New York after 
I was married. My, my wife is from Dayton. We would stay in Dayton when, you know, when there was no work in, in the Midwest. And we'd stay in New York at my mother's house when there was no work in the East. And I decided that the only way to do this right was to take a stand. And that, now don't forget, I'm still in my uh, clean suit and tie, short hair, period. And I decided if I could get a little place in New York, in, in the Greenwich, Greenwich Village, where I could work out all the time, like a coffee house, and I could develop myself there and get people to come in, get Merv Griffin to come in and see me, get Carson Show to come in and see me. Uh, that's what I need. So I did that. I took a stand. I found a place called the Cafe or Go Go. I spent two years there on and off. I could work and go away from there for two months. I could come back for a week. I could go away for two weeks, come back for three days. I could work anything I wanted for, they were sometimes $5 a night, sometimes just a hamburger, sometimes on a weekend, $65 if you were working with Bill Evans or someone like that. So I did that for two years and I got Merv Griffin in and that's that's what gave me my start. At the place I'm talking about, the Cafe Ogogo, Richard Pryor was in the same state I was. Richard Pryor was still an unknown comedian who hadn't done any television. And he was doing, he was in his um, inoffensive era, uh, his inoffensive period. He was in his doing Rumpelstiltskin. He did a little, uh, <laughs> uh, there was a famous R Richard Pryor early piece called Rumpelstiltskin. That's what got him on the Merv Griffin show. He was down there working out. We would smoke some joints up there in the high, high staircase in the basement of this place. And we would do our bits. Occasionally we'd be on stage together. I don't remember much about that. But um, the, the people came in to see Richard Pryor one night from Merv Griffin. And they gave him an interview the next week. So he got his interview. And then I'm still laboring, laboring, laboring there. And he gets a show from them, and he goes and does the show. Well, by the time he got the show, in between his interview and the show, I had gotten my interview. But then he had his show. So I was one step behind him. So then he got his second show. Then I got, I passed my interview, and I got my first show. So the two of us grew out of that room into this syndicated television exposure, which was na nationwide and was always watched by the networks. And that was how the two of us sprung, uh, sprung to life. Well, one of the good things about the 70s, you released those albums that most people hear, hear on uh, XM Comedy all the time. Uh, FM and AM, Class Clown, Occupation Fool, yeah. Toledo Window Box. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, I believe it was, I don't know if you know, but it was yesterday or this week, is the 25th anniversary of uh, yeah, you did, you told Class me that. Clown, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's nice to know. That, those were four gold albums. I had four gold albums in a row, 72, 3, 4, and 5. And uh, then I had a couple after that weren't gold. That was in the, what I call the Little David years, the Little David Records, right. owned by Flip Wilson and his manager, who then became my manager, and I was signed to the label. And uh, yeah, that, that was the thing. You see, you need a way, if, if you're going to do quote unquote, material that should be uncensored you know i don't i hate this designation adult you know or, or, or x-rated or something but if you're going to do realistic spoken word art uh you need if you're going to get a mass audience you need a medium and the medium at that time was records right. you certainly couldn't do it on television that was commercial and they didn't allow that kind of uh language or those ideas if it were if it was just the ideas that were dangerous to them so um I, I got my mass audience through the records. The records fed the box office at the co college concerts. The college concerts fed the record sales, and it went around. Plus, you do some television and talk about both. I'll be in Buffalo, I'll be in Toronto, and I'll be in Niagara, you know, be in Niagara Falls. And uh, by the way, FM and AM, but you did it a little more gracefully than that. So the whole thing worked. Then I ran out of, then I ran out of record career. You know, you can't be the hot new guy in town forever. Right. You can't be the fastest gun because a faster gun is coming to town in a few years. So uh, my record career began to kind of wane in the 70s, as did the counterculture. The disco came into came into play and the people who are the true hippies and the true radicals, they kind of retreated to the hills and the other ones went and got MBAs and stuff like that. <laughs> and, um, and, and there I was, sort of not knowing who I was and who I should become, you know, to, to be true to myself. So I drift, drifted a while, and that's when cable started. That's when HBO started at 75 or 76, and mm -hmm. I got on there in 77. 
and now I've done 13 of them. That's my way of reaching the mass audience. Right. It was uh, the first one was George Carlin, 77, George Carlin again, 78, mm -hmm. uh, Carlin at Carnegie Hall, 82, Carlin on campus, 84, <laughs> yep. playing with your head, 86. What am I doing in New Jersey? 88. 1988, doing, doing it again, 1990, jamming in New York was 92, they did that 40 years of comedy special in 96, back in town, uh, you are all diseased in 99, complaints, <laughs> that got a lot of, uh, yeah. uh, complaints and grievances in 2001 and life is worth losing in 2005. Right. I, I've been told that uh, the uh, jamming in New York was a special one for you. Well, it was, uh, you, you know, one of the big turning points you know, I'm an entertainer because I, I, I do I work in an entertainment circuit, but there's an artist at work too. Uh, not all entertainers are artists. Some are just entertainers, and they're, they kind of experience life, uh, their, their creative lives in a static way. They get to a certain place, and they kind of stay there. Mm. Uh, other people who have an artistic element or, or component grow because artists always grow and go somewhere. Artists are on a journey. They don't know where it is going. They don't know. They don't want to know. They just know there's something else. There's something more. There's more in me. There's more to talk about. There's more to look at. A painter, a, co a composer, they grow, they live, they grow. It's, a, it's an ongoing thing. So that w is true for me as a writer. That's the artistic part of me as the writer. Well, uh, what am I answering again? I'll, I'll get to it. <laughs> just <laughs> help me out. You were talking about the HBO special. Yeah, well, and the change is right. The, 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 so, so, the, so the artist goes through phases and changes. And uh, I found my comic voice as a younger person in, in, in the coffee houses. I found my comic voice. And then that comic voice lasted until the uh, late 60s, early 70s, when I made that change uh, to the countercultural type material. That was a, a shift. That was a paradigm shift. And, and that um, was a change in voice, the comic voice and the writer voice. And then in 19, and, and then through the 70s, I developed that and then said, then I kind of lost track of what would be next. And was, I didn't know, I kind of drifted and I was grasping. Then in 92, even though I did these HBO shows and, and they were plenty good, I like them. I still would stand behind every word of them, but there wasn't a new voice yet. There was just like an improved voice that was ongoing. Mm. In 1992, I discovered silence on the stage. I discovered that you could have long periods of silence. The show I did, Jammin' in New York, had a long, more or less serious piece called The Planet is Fine, The People Are Fucked. And, <clears throat> and it was about the fact that the planet will outlive us. Don't worry about the planet. People who tell you they're worried about the planet are not. They're worried about themselves and their habitat. They want a clean place to live. And that's fine. But don't be talking about how you're going to save the planet. You're not. The planet will outlive you and it will heal itself. And that piece was very thoughtful and very interesting. And I loved it. But I had to learn that there were times in the show when I, it was OK not to get laughs. It, because one of the jobs I have, besides getting laughs, is to engage the imagination. Just, in general, to engage the person's imagination. If I make them laugh along the way, that's part of the deal for me. But I learned then that I had a kind of a more serious writer voice in me. And that's when another shift took place. And the shows that follow, that came in the 90s, are representative of that. There's more of a social commentator in them. There's more of a, if you will, a quote unquote philosophy uh, beginning to emerge. And uh, that was another important shift for me that is still playing out. Plus, it was the first live one. It was the first live one. It was New York City. It was the first one done in New York City for me. I did it at Madison Square Garden, not in the big arena, but in the theater there that holds about 6,500. So it was a big audience. It was live, and it was my hometown. And I was king of that town for a night, you know. It really felt good. I looked out my hotel window that night, and I thought, yeah, yeah, you know, this is my town. One of those kind of scenes you'd see in a movie, kind of a cheesy scene. You it was know? sort of an adult version of when your mother's friends used to pat you on the head and go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> it was just a, a, a graduated version. Uh, I still haven't covered books or uh, mm. movies, but I promised to let people ask questions that are going on and on. Questions. Are there anyone here that wants to step up and have a question? Anybody? See, it's probably They're in awe of you. Okay, <laughs> great. Just state your name, please. And, uh... Hi, my name is Alan. Hi, Alan. Um, first of all, it's very rare that you get to meet somebody that is an idol 
of you know, uh, and thank you. 30 years ago, I was introduced to that on that first HBO special that you talked about, and I just thank you for 30 years of thank you making that's, me laugh. That's very nice. Um, I'm curious about some of the comics that you've worked with. Who's the funniest that you look back at and you think, man, that guy is? You you knew when you saw him that he was going to be as good as you know you've yeah. ever seen. Well. Well, the one, the only one that comes to mind, I'm sure if I searched my memory or if I had a better memory, I'd have, have other examples. But Louis Black was someone I saw early in his exposure, and I knew this was a unique and um, strong voice, <laughs> to say the least. So Louis Black, I, I love him. I love it, that, that um, sort of um, theatricalized anger and uh, and the things he talks about. He's got a good mind. I like good minds. Uh, he, he's one that I think of. I never hung out with comics. I, I still don't. I'm a loner. I'm a real kind of uh, loner and an outsider. I never hung out in comedy clubs, and I, of course I didn't never worked in them, so I didn't need to hang out in them, but it also, I was just never attracted to that the, the comic um, culture, uh, the where comedians we like to hang out together. Um, so I, I don't have a lot of knowledge. I didn't have a lot of um, occurrences of being able to see someone early and say that. But but Lewis Black was one that definitely sprang to mind. Lewis tells a great story how CBS wanted to do a series based on him, <laughs> and he had to go and audition for the part of himself. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And he didn't get it. Yeah, that's, right. that's great. <laughs> he yeah. said, well, luckily, I never made the air, so I didn't matter. I recall that. Uh, anyone else? Sure, why not? Don't, ask, don't wait for me to be asked. Just walk up to the microphone. Oh, wait. Hi, my name's Chris. Hi, um, Chris. You've had the chance to see the entertainment industry evolve tremendously over, uh, over your career. Yeah. And uh, one thing that's I've heard said, and whether it's true or not, is that if you saw a lot of people who are icons today, such as yourself, if you started today the way the system is set up, you might not get the sure. opportunities. You maybe never would have had the chance to become who you are. That's right. Do you think that's a, a fair assessment, or do you think the entertainment industry in general has improved or, or just changed or gotten worse over your career? Well, de depending on the individual, uh, that's, that's both true and, and not true. Um, I would say with user-generated content and uh, the viral uh, quality of the uh, Internet, that a person who is self-made, let's use that for a shorthand, a person who wants to be self-made has some avenues that certainly I didn't. But on the other hand, life and the world and show business were simpler then, so it was easier to see where the path ought to be. I mean, there was, there was only one way I was going to get started, and that was uh, to get on a radio station and in the midst of having that career going, to look around at places where I might have a chance to learn to be a stand-up. You know, there were some nightclubs and there were some coffee houses. So the world and the choices were limited, which was probably good for me. But um, I think if I had had the same tools uh, genetically and had them reinforced as they were for me in this era, um, and I had these impulses to, to, to show myself off, I think I may have found a way, but God knows how different it may have been. And or, and how much longer it may have taken. It, it's a much more complicated place. I don't, I, I don't envy, uh, I wouldn't want to come of age at this time, although I see some big, a lot of advantages in it that we didn't have. I see that and I understand that. But I'm very happy that I came of age in the, in the period I did because it was, it was uh, you, you, could, you could grab it. You could kind of put your hands on all of it without much effort, you know. And that mm -hmm. now it's, it's, it's pretty elusive and pretty fragmented. Now, you mentioned you sort of, I don't uh, give up is the word, but you didn't take the movie idea of being a movie star right. quite as seriously. I wasn't after an while. actor. And you've done movies here and there, and you've done uh, uh, voices and animated films. Mm -hmm. You were the uh, Volkswagen bus in cars. cars right? Fillmore. Yeah. But you all, but recently you did, uh, you played uh, Ben Affleck's dad in Jersey Girl. Yeah, that was, that I, I was like a serious that. role. That, well, that was written for me, and, that, and I could show my sweet side. Uh, and ira a bit of irascibility, but, but there was a sweetness to the role. It was a grandfatherly role. Uh, it was written uh, on a model of his father, and so it was kind of more suited for who I was at the time. The other, uh, the other thing I'm proud of having done, I did a, a, a Hallmark... Um, miniseries called uh, Streets of Laredo, which was a continuation of um, Lonesome Dove. 
and it was the authentic continuation. There's, a, there's an ersatz continuation that was kind of bogus, but this was the authentic one. And I did a, I did a part of an old uh, scout, and it, it, I really felt good about that. And then Prince of Tides, I played the gay neighbor, Eddie, and I was really happy with the way that came out. But I wasn't really born to be an actor. If I had trained all my life, it would have been a different story. If I had learned technique and training, yes, but I, 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 didn't, uh, I didn't have the tools. Hello, I'm Michael. Hi, Mike. Uh, Mr. Carlin, um, we know a lot of your comedy comes from things that really piss you off. What are some of the things that really piss you off that you haven't really talked about on stage lately? Well, um, it, you catch me short because I don't have my computer at hand and I can't go look for a lot of stuff. Um, I'm blessed with some pretty deep files. Um, I, I, I do, I, I don't suffer writer's block, believe me. I, I, uh, this current show I'm doing, I went in there and I dug out the whole 75 minutes all at once and, uh, well, in, in, during that w a week's time, took it all out and began doing it the way it was, you know, those 75 minutes from scratch. So I'm very proud of that productivity record. But, um, I think it's not so much <clears throat> what I've, I'm angry about, because I... Anger in, implies that you have a stake in the outcome, that you care. And I don't really care. I don't. I, f I mean, it comes across as anger, you know. I, obviously, there's a, there's a, a theatrical, there's a heightened kind of intensified theatrical anger that you need to convey these thoughts. But I'm not personally an angry man. I'm not personally angry about these things. I think they're, they're wonderful because I root against the species. I finally, I finally came... I came to a realization, and this freed me as a, as a writer. This was part of that transformation in the 90s. I realized I didn't really care about this outcome on this planet. I didn't care what happened to the species. I think this is a species that was given great gifts and had great potential and squandered them. I think this species squandered them. I think it shows poor ways of organizing itself, socially and politically. I think it made a wrong turn when it came to buying the, the okie doke that the spiritual leaders gave, the, the high priests. We turned it over to the high priests and the traders. It's commerce and religion that have ruined and, and, and spoiled the potential of this, uh, of this species. And in this country, the same two things are true, but this country is writ large, and this country is the leader in the decay of the soul, if you will, just I use that metaphorically. Um, it, it's just, and I just don't care what happens to this country. I don't care. I don't give a fuck. So, and you know what the anger, the only anger there is, and I recognize one in my voice there, you know what that is? It, it's really a, a, a reflection of disappointment and disillusionment and, and being let down by my species. You know, we had such great possibilities and they're not being realized. You know, they talk, you know, talk about poets and philosophers and well, aren't there, yes, there are. How much influence do they have? None. There are more people writing poetry in America than there are reading it. Imagine that. Well, I guess that's true in a lot of fields, but... <laughs> It's, it's just, it, it, I think that's the anger. It's a frustration. It's a, it's a letdown, you know? It comes from, you know, how could you do it? That's why I usually always use the second person, you know? I talk about the audience and I say, how can you, you know what you did? You know, I don't say, you know what we did here in this country. I say, you know what you people did? I put it on them. It's not my problem, <laughs> you know? So anyway, that's just a taste of, of, of what eats around the edges for me. And if you don't know, if you want more of George's philosophy, the, the books... Uh, brain droppings, napalm, silly putty. When will Jesus bring the pork chops? Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes a little brain damage can help. It was actually originally a promotional item. For it was it. actually a, a magazine size right. item to be sold at concerts. But I didn't. Uh, I wanted to put out some material uh, in there, uh, so I threw pictures in too, because you have to have pictures in it. Right. It's, it's kind of a it's a pseudo book, quasi quasi book. So if you want to know more of the philosophy, he was just. Uh, Spewing. Some of it is in there, yeah. Yeah, right, just read those books, because I would like to end on that note, but there's a couple of other questions. Uh, one of them that you don't like to be asked is, oh, have you ever thought about when this is going to end, when you're going to retire? <laughs> oh, no, I, I don't mind being asked that. Um, no, it's, the, the, like I say, the artist is never satisfied. If you begin to be satisfied, you know, something's wrong with you. Uh, the, if you pardon this highfalutin, you know, terminology, I'm talking about the artist part, you know. Um, 
Pablo Casals, the great cellist, master of the cello uh, of the last century, one of the outstanding musicians of the last century, he, uh, he was in his 90s, and he was still doing uh, a few recitals, and he would practice three hours a day. He practiced his cello three hours a day. And someone said to him at some point, they said, Master Casals, you know, you are a past master. You are the maestro. Uh, why, at your age, do you bother practicing three times a day? I mean, three hours a day. And he said, well, I'm beginning to notice some improvement. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the answer. I mean, why stop? You know, it, only if nature stops me, if I lose the ability to write or speak, speak uh, some alteration in plans will be necessary. But I've already imagined, because they do have this for people who are totally paralyzed, that the movement of your eyes, you can look at a keyboard that's projected and you can type by moving your eyes to the letters. And they'll have that perfected by the time I'm paralyzed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, assuming, I'm assuming that. Well. To quote George Carlin, uh, art doesn't have a finish line. No, right, yeah. It's, it's just a race, uh, but uh, against yourself with no reward except self, you know, sat the satisfaction of explaining yourself in some symbolic form or direct form in my case. Painting is more symbolic. Would you uh, leave us with what you would put on your grave still? What's your epitaph supposed to read? He was here just a minute ago. <laughs> George Carlin. Thank you very much. Thank you all.